Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Today, against my better judgement, I'm reviewing another Steam Loco from EFE Rail. A few years ago now, I reviewed this J94 from DJM, and it's safe to say I didn't like it very much. I felt that it was very cheaply produced in that it was very light and plasticky, the level of detail wasn't that great, and the performance in my opinion sucked. It had a cordless motor fitted to it, but not one of the big chunky ones like you'd find in a Backman Loco today. It was one of the little puny ones and there was no torque to it. My controller of choice at the time was a feedback controller and cordless motors are not compatible with feedback controllers so I ended up running this off a cheap Hornby train set controller which made the performance seem even worse. Not a great loco, quite disappointed with it back in the day. So you can imagine my surprise when I saw that Backman had brought back the DJM J94 at a new and much higher price of £149.95. And when they did that, I remember thinking, crikey, that seems extortionate for what is a relatively naff model. Tried to choose my words carefully there. But thankfully, very, very thankfully to that, you guys said sod off. I assume these didn't sell very well because they're still in stock in many places and quite a few retailers now have dropped the price significantly. At one retailer I saw these as cheap as £79.50 which is close to half price. So like I said at the start, against my better judgement I decided to pick one up because I haven't tried one of these under the EFE Rail brand. Mine was a few years ago, like I say, from DJM. I want to know whether the model's been changed. I doubt it, I highly doubt it, but perhaps things have been done to this loco to make it worth nearly £150. I've noticed that this has a next 18 pin decoder socket in it now. I don't think that was the case with the DJM loco, so something's been done to these, but I don't exactly know what. I picked this one up before the price drops had reached their full extent, so I didn't quite get it for £79. I got this one for £89 from the model centre, but that's still obviously a good discount. So, well done everybody for refusing to buy the overpriced tat, and I'm very glad that the prices have had to be pulled down for this. Hopefully that's lesson learned, but I doubt it. Anyway, we're going to see what this is like. We'll see if it's any better than the DJM one. If it is, great, that's a model I can enjoy. If it's not, also great, I'll just rant at how rubbish and overpriced this is. So let's get started, hopefully this will be fun. So here we go again. I find myself looking once again at the incredibly depressing packaging design of the EFE Rail locomotive. And I've come to associate this box design with disappointment, unfortunately, because every single loco I've looked at from EFE Rail so far has been an old model brought back at a new price without sufficient updates. I'm trying not to prejudge this loco too much before I've seen it, but clearly I'm not expecting much. Anyway, let me show you what I've got here on the end of the box. So this is E85003. It is a J94, number 19, in the National Coal Board livery. And sure enough, yes, this has a Next18 DCC decoder socket in it. Nothing much to see on the box, except that it was distributed on behalf of Kerno Model Rail Centre. And that's kind of what EFE Rail is. It's kind of a distribution for locomotive manufacturers who otherwise don't have the means to widely distribute their locomotives. I also suspect that Backman charge a hefty fee for that privilege, which could explain why these models are so often ridiculously overpriced. But let's see if this one is. Let's lift the lid for the first time and let's have a look. Right, so we've got decent packaging, sturdy box, lots of foam. And here we have some sort of instruction manual and also the loco. Yep, I told you, it's an interesting livery. It's one of the reasons I wanted to try this because I knew the loco itself wouldn't be that interesting. Although again, maybe that's an unfair prejudgment. We'll have a look. Anyway, first of all, here is the instruction manual for the EFE Rail Class J94. 
Apparently it's a highly detailed working replica that will give you years of pleasure and reliable operation if handled with care and never removed from the box. What, sorry? <clears throat> no, I misread that slightly. Okay, running in, it's a carefully engineered scale model. Okay, short period of running in, that's fine. Motor, coreless, decoder, next 18, fair enough. Um, be careful taking it out of the packaging, firm surface, not on carpet. Trust me, carpet or not, the DJM one did not run well, so it didn't matter. Lubrication, yeah, lubrication is necessary, we know that. Okay, let's see what's changed with the DCC decoder fitting. So, it's got a socket which is cleaverly hidden. Look at that, cleaverly. We're obviously not that clever, are we, folks, if we can't spell the word cleverly? Let's read the whole sentence. The cleaverly hidden behind the locomotive smoke box conversion of this locomotive DCC operation is door. What? <laughs> English? What's going on here? Do you know what's happened? This is supposed to be two columns, isn't it? <laughs> For some reason, this one section of the instructions has been separated into two columns. All right, so it's just bad formatting and a lack of proofreading. Okay, anyway, so yeah, you get to the DCC socket. Unlike the clever Dapol solution, this DCC socket is not mounted onto a drawer that can be easily pulled out. With the DJM one, at least, and according to the photos, the same is true of this, you just pull the circuit board out with its wires dangling and fit the decoder socket, so not a refined solution. A lot about warranty there, and then on the back, we've got an exploded diagram. Yeah, it's a split chassis locomotive that doesn't have pickups, not a good design in my opinion. Absolutely loads of gears, too many. In fact, the DJM one had all of its axles driven, so it's over-engineered and over-complicated, makes a lot of noise, and all of the gears wasted a lot of the torque. That was the case on the old version. We'll see whether this has been changed to improve that. And with that, let's have a look at the locomotive. My brain hurts after those instructions, quite honestly. All right, so it's an interesting livery, and it does look as though it's been pretty well done. Let's take this out and let's have a look at the accessories bag, which were not explained in the instructions, so we'll see. So you've got an odd looking pair of NEM couplings there, interesting. You've got a painted piece here which goes between the loco frames and that represents the valve gear, although there's not much detail on there. Not sure why that's not just fitted anyway. And then we've got buffer beam detail. We have got coupling hooks, but not the screw link couplings, unfortunately. Again, that seems a little bit cheeky on a loco with an ROP of 150 quid. I would say I'm surprised at that, but honestly, I'm not. So let's get this loco out. Let's see whether it's any good. I remember the DJM one being very lightweight, so we'll see if this one still is. All right peel the plastic off it. We've got a bit of foam in the coal bunker. So let's pull that out. And here is the loco. And yet, yeah, it still feels pretty lightweight. The level of detail looks to be pretty much the same. Although I have to say, I do like this livery a lot. The finish is quite plasticky, unfortunately. Although I'm not dead surprised at that because the same was true of the DJM version. And in terms of the chassis, it looks pretty much the same. I can still see that every axle is driven and there are no pickups, which suggests that this is still the split chassis arrangement. So yeah, I think I'm going to enjoy this. He lied. And we'll proceed with that in just a second. I'll show you this up close and we'll talk about the detail. But first of all, here's a bit of background on the J94, or I guess this is not a J94, this is actually just the Hunslet Austerity, isn't it? But whatever, they're quite similar. Let's talk about that then, and the difference between the two. The Hunslet Austerity 060 saddle tank was a class of 485 tank engines built by the Hunslet Engine Company. These were constructed between 1943 and 1964, and they were notable for being the standard British shunting locomotive during the Second World War. 75 of these locos were purchased by the LNER in 1946, and it was they who classified them as J94, as they're quite commonly referred to. The locos weighed in at 49 tonnes, they ran on two inside cylinders, and produced attractive effort in the region of 106 kilonewtons. As well as being used by the War Department and the LNER, the Hunslet Austerities were widely used by various industries, some of the better known ones being the National Coal Board, as we've got here, and also Scunthorpe Steelworks. 
while many of these engines have been withdrawn and scrapped, an unbelievable number of them remain in preservation. No less than 70 can still be seen out in the world today. Although only two of them are original LNER J94s, quite a few of them have been painted into LNER livery to represent a J94, even though they're not actually J94s. I think that's quite interesting. So there it is, up close and personal for you, the EFE Rail J94 in the very interesting NCB blue and yellow, I guess. Well, this is not going to be a complete rant because I have to say the build quality on this is pretty high in that there's no visible glue and there's not that many wonky details. I think that's partly because the model is incredibly simple, but also I think because a degree of care has been taken during the assembly, so I do want to reflect that. Obviously, I also did not pay full price for this. Obviously, the price I paid was significantly discounted, but some people will have paid a lot more than I did for this. Some retailers, in fact, my local retailer, does sell at RRP, and so there will be people who paid £149.95 for this locomotive. And let's see what those people got for their money, shall we? Well, first of all, due to the plastic construction of the body, this is a very light loco. So you've got plastic tanks, plastic running plate even, and the chassis can't be that substantial because the weight comes in at just 156 grams. Now, to be fair, that is some five grams heavier than the old DJM version of the loco, which was 151 grams. But if we compare it to a different loco of a very similar size, the Care Stewart Victory, for instance, from Planet Industrials, the weight of that loco is almost 100 grams more at 242 grams, which kind of goes to illustrate how dramatically light this loco is. I have to say, though, the running plate is perfectly straight, so there's no warping or anything. It's just purely the lightweight and the cheap nature of the model that I'm complaining about there. OK, so the level of detail is not fantastic either. We've got a visible screw in the top of the chimney, which is just a bizarre design choice, I think. Plastic buffers with a plastic finish on them, so that's not great. They are sprung low, so there's that. You've got plastic whistles and safety valves, which look more like blobs of plastic, really. Just painted, not that great. Handrails around the side of the cab, these are just part of the moulding, and they're picked out with paint, not separately fitted. The top of the cab just has the moulded vent, it's not separately fitted or poseable, so that's quite simple. Moulded lamp brackets on the running plate, not separately fitted ones, and simple cab detailing, which is pretty free of separately fitted parts. The back head here is just a moulded piece that's been painted. It doesn't have the separately fitted controls, and I think those would have looked better because they would stand out from the back head a little bit more. So there's nothing wrong with the level of detail per se, but it isn't that detailed and it's also a very light and plasticky loco, so there's no good reason why this should have cost 150 quid. And thankfully you guys spotted that and presumably a lot of people voted with their wallets and were not prepared to pay that for this loco, which I'm really glad to see. Let's talk about the livery then. So the finish is okay, it's not particularly satin, quite a plastic finish on this, but the quality of the painting is okay, I suppose. You've got the NCB lettering on the side, which is good. The cab is actually a separate part from the saddle tank, if I remember correctly, so that explains why the join between those two components is so clean, but it is clean, so that's good to see. You've got the separately painted buffer beam, which also has the running number printed onto it. The NEM pockets are pretty bad. Yeah, very stiff moving, and they kind of get stuck, as you can see, at the extremes of their travel. Um, yeah, not that difficult to create a pocket that pivots and yet returns to the centre, and this one just doesn't. The one on the back's a little bit better, I suppose, but it's still a strange design. And then you've got the very nicely glossy wheels. You can see the finish on those wheels is a lot better than on the rest of the model, possibly because those wheels are metal and not plastic. And then you've got the coupling rod, which I really like because it's been painted red. It's a very thin and feeble coupling rod. I'm not sure if it's made of plastic. Possibly it is just sort of punched out of a sheet of metal or something like that, but at least visually it looks okay. The cab windows are glazed, as you can see, and each window is individually glazed as well, but as you can see, the pieces of plastic are absolutely gigantic, um, not particularly fine. 
and around the back we've got the molded grill effect on the windows but again this has not come out too well it looks like someone's tried to squeeze through the bars and bent them a little bit you've also got the coal load which is pre-fitted and there's a bit of decent texture to that coal load i think which is good to see and around the back you do have separately fitted lamp brackets which are nicely fitted that's good to see too there is an absolute minimum of detail between the frames. There is that little plastic piece that you can put in there to represent the cylinders, but really I think that's a missed opportunity. I'm not sure why that wasn't fitted from the factory, and I'm not sure why it wasn't painted up to a greater extent, because a bit of the valve gear picked out with paint, I think would have really made it stand out and look a lot better. In terms of separately fitted details, we've got the wire handrails, which are nicely applied. That's good to see. You've got the smoke box dart, which sticks out quite a long way. I've looked at photos of the real things, and yeah, the smoke box darts do seem to poke out quite a way, so that's actually realistic, believe it or not. And then on the other side, you've got the separately fitted reverser rod, as well as a few other details. Again, nothing wrong with the way these have been applied. It's just not my cup of tea. Even the sort of plastic seam line across the top of the saddle tank just makes this seem like more of a toy than a proper model. And of course, when you pick it up and feel how light and plasticky it is, that really just compounds that feeling. I feel like this could have made a great beginner's loco for sort of 80 to 100 quid. Around the price that they've been discounted to, that's absolutely fine. But the fact that they tried to squeeze people for so much money for this cheap thing, yeah, that does rub me up the wrong way a little bit. But yeah, it's okay, it's quite nicely put together, but otherwise it's definitely nothing to shout about. Now though, let's get it down onto the track and let's see what the performance is like. So there she is down onto the track, looking pretty cool I must say in this livery and I still say that the livery is one of the few redeeming factors of this loco. It is unique in my collection and I do like it for that reason. Anyway, the first performance test has already been filmed and I'll let you know how that went in just a second. Next up, I went on and took a look at the mechanism and this is what I want to talk about to start with. Now, first I wanted to investigate how cleverly the decoder socket had been hidden away inside the smoke box. But the smoke box, which is supposed to be just held on by magnets, was not coming loose. So I decided to put my microphone back on and do it live. Right, so I've just tried to put my nail underneath this hinge to pull the front of the door off and it's stuck way more than it would be under just the force of the magnets alone. So I've decided to film this, see what happens. It's worth pointing out that Dapol, who do this sort of thing better, they actually provide you with a little spudger tool that goes behind the smoke box. Oh, broken a nail, <laughs> goodness sake. Yeah, which makes this easier. Uh, this is stuck on with something else because that is not magnets holding that. Oh, all right, got it. Well, that doesn't look very good. We've got one magnet there, another magnet missing. I can guess where it is though. Well, no, I guessed wrong. It's not stuck to this. So I guess they just fit one magnet now. Anyway, the decoder socket was lurking in the darkness and without any tool to pull it out like you get with the Dapol Locos and without enough room to get my fingers in there to pull it out, I ended up getting some pliers and sort of pulling them out like that. And sure enough, there is the next 18 pin decoder socket, which is different from, I think it was a six pin or something on the old DJM one. And I guess once you've done that, then the DCC fitting is quite straightforward. Still not as intuitive as on the Dapol Locos though. They did this so much better with the pull-out drawer and providing the tools that you need to do it. This one's just a bit naff, piggling away at the smoke box door to try and get it to come off. Nah, it's not for me, unfortunately. Right, so the base keeper plate does very little on this loco. I guess it's just a cover maybe to protect the gears from some dust. Anyway, I removed it and you can see the axles cannot be removed for cleaning. And that's a problem because the axles themselves do the picking up. There are no pickups. It's literally a conductive bearing and that's how the loco picks up power. Not a fan of this design. Obviously it can work well to start with, but then when those axles get dirty, what do you do? You can't clean them. You have to take the wheel set apart, literally take the wheels off the axle, I believe, in order to get access to those axles to clean them. And at the end of the day, almost every loco I have in the collection with this kind of design does not run as well as a loco with traditional wiper pickups. 
The advantage is there's less friction than with wiper pickups, but the disadvantage is less reliability, so I don't understand why manufacturers do this. So yeah, this is a split chassis loco, and you can see where the two halves of the chassis connect here. All of the axles are geared as well, that seems unnecessarily complex. This design feature made my J94 from DJM incredibly noisy, although interestingly this one really isn't that noisy, so noise, not too much of a problem. However, more gears does mean more stuff that could potentially go wrong. I don't see why this would need to be so unnecessarily complicated. Right, body removal. I never properly achieved this on my DJM J94 video and I'm determined to give you a look inside this loco today so that you can see just how naff the internals are. So, I undid the two rear body screws, I undid the screw that's hidden inside the chimney and remembering the DJM version of this model, that should have been all I needed to do. However, the body was not budging. You have got the reverser rod stopping the cab from being lifted off, but uh, yeah, there was some real resistance there. I think the body was all sort of painted after assembly because I think the paint was maybe holding it all together. But anyway, with a lot of faffing, I managed to get the body to come off. And as you can see, there's really not a lot inside here. All of this that you can see is plastic, so the sort of enclosure around the motor, not die cast, so very light plastic. Same with the front of the smoke box area, all just plastic. I don't know why all this is plastic. Were they trying to make this as light as possible? I have no idea. Anyway, I want to show you the motor we've got inside here, so I took this plastic assembly apart. Couldn't get the motor out of there, but you can see the diameter of it. Very, very small coreless motor. No flywheel or anything like that, so very cheap, bare bones. You can buy these coreless motors for literally a couple of pounds on eBay. Although, admittedly, this motor does work better than the one that was in the DJM J94, so I'll give credit where credit's due there. Similarly, the gauging is not a problem at all. This came in at 14.2 to 14.4 millimeters back to back on each axle, which is definitely sufficiently close to the standard. So the mechanism isn't for me. Very cheap, not a lot of metal, very difficult to access, and generally not a mechanism that is befitting of a 150 pound tank engine. Anyway, let's go back in time. Let me show you how that first performance test went. Okay, moment of truth. Is this gonna work and how well is this going to work? No idea at the moment, so let's find out. Forwards direction, let's see if there are any signs of life. Here we go. Oh yeah. It's actually a really nice start. Yeah, it started off very, very smoothly there. And how's the speed and the gearing, 50%? Yeah, reasonably sensible, actually, yeah. That's a smart speed. So, straight away, this performance seems different from the DJM version of the model. Um, could be because I'm using a different controller these days, but yeah, this does seem a lot better than that one was, straight out of the box. Uh, it's not been running yet, I should say, but let's try a crawl. I'm just easing it up on the controller. Bit more. I think it's cut out, actually. Oh, saved itself. I heard it sort of uh, fizz and then it started again. Let's try that again because it looks like it should be able to do a good crawl. If not, I might have to wait till it's run in. Oh no, there we go. Nudge it. So yeah, it's actually able to do a fantastic crawl, which is very, very impressive. Uh, it seems at the moment the only thing stopping it is the continuity with the track. It does sort of keep cutting out. Um, hopefully that will improve as this runs in, and hopefully that's not just an inherent issue with the pickup power split chassis design, um, which, as you know, I'm not dead keen on. There we go, a little cut out again. If I turn it up, it sort of saves itself. I don't, I don't think it's the motor stalling. I do think it's cutting out. So quite impressed with that. In terms of torque, let's have a look at that. Oh, I see it's cut out now. I've turned it up. Let's turn it up even more. See, it's at 50% power there. Anyway, well, let's do the torque test. If I nudge it, it should start. So yeah, it's able to turn its wheels. I'm quite impressed by that, actually. I remember the DJM version having very poor torque. So I don't know, it's got a different motor. You guys will know. 
maybe the in maybe the internals of the motor are different. I'm not sure. But yeah, performance wise, to say it's not been run in yet, I have to be fair to this and say that it is very, very good. Right, forwards direction, let's get this run in. Okay, so yeah, the stoppages are an issue, it's just stopped on points, just this second. And if it does that again, I'll get it on camera for you. Um, but in terms of the actual smoothness of the run, when it's not cutting out, very, very good. It's not as noisy as the DJM1. Um, maybe it's better lubricated, maybe the gears are made of a different material, I don't know. But there seems to be a noticeable difference here. And I will run the DJM1 for you later on so that you can hear the difference. Maybe that's just in my head. We'll have to see when we get it running. But yeah, it seems to be okay, seems to be staying on the track. It does have very fine scale flanges, which could be an issue on sort of unlevel track. But my layout is kind of a good benchmark for badly laid track. And at the moment, this one seems to be running okay on it. So that seems to be fine. Anyway, this can have 30 minutes in either direction. And then we'll come back once it's fully running and we'll do some more testing. All right, I'll see you in a second. Okay, that is running in complete. And it went pretty well in that the loco did not derail and the fine flanges didn't seem to be causing any problems. But yeah, it does keep cutting out on points. Every couple of laps, it'll stop on various points. Again, I think it's just this pickup solution. It's not as good as traditional wiper pickups. Other than that though, yeah, it's nice and smooth. Seems to be better, definitely, than the DJM one, which is interesting. Anyway, the pulling power, you'll be unsurprised to hear, is quite poor. 0.22 newtons, that's around 16 coaches. Uh, the Rapido Hunslet 16 inch, which is a smaller loco than this, was actually more powerful than this. So yeah, again, lightweight, not sure why it is quite so light. To test its pulling power, I've set up these wagons. Hopefully that will be a decent test of this loco's abilities. But now let's do some more testing and see what the performance is like after running in. So as you can see, it is a good smooth loco. I do love the way this runs. And uh, like I say, it is also a lot quieter than the DJM one as well. Not sure why, not sure why. Maybe the material that the gears are made of is different. Not sure, but yeah, it is good and controlled, nice and quiet. And uh, we still got some torque there. Oops. Yeah, I mean, the wheels slow down when I put my finger there but there's enough power for them to turn quite adequately. So yeah, the torque of the mechanism is okay. Let's have a look at the crawl then. I didn't really get to test this crawl properly before because it kept cutting out. Now that the axles have run in, that might not happen anymore. So let's see. Yeah, look at that. So this is one aspect of the Loco that is very, very pleasing. I love the way that this can crawl. A lot of control there, very, very smooth as well. Oh, it has cut out. Again, this is the pickups. No good pickups. To say it's no to say it's not got a flywheel. The performance here is pretty good. There we go, it's going again. But um yeah, I, I would say really, if you're serious, you're probably gonna want to run this on DCC with some sort of stay alive on board. Because it's just going to irritate you if it keeps cutting out. It doesn't do it too badly on standard points, but on the express points, it certainly does. So that's something to bear in mind. Anyway, let's head back and let's couple up to the wagons. Oh, I put a coupling in the back. Yes, I should say I've already done that. So I should at least be able to couple in a very controlled manner. So hopefully that's done the job. Let's pull forwards and see. Oh, no. Right, maybe I maybe I was too controlled. Let's try again. No, it didn't sound good. No, it's still not got it. What's going on there then? Ah, oh, well, that's odd. The back coupling was okay when I did the detail section, but now, as you can see, it's stuck to one side rather than returning to the center. Come to think of it, I did undo the coupling screw when I was trying to remove the body because I wondered whether there was a body screw underneath it. So I'm just going to grab a screwdriver and we'll see if uh, loosening off that coupling does make a difference. Right, let's gently loosen this off. I'm going to have to just pop the brake rigging out. There we go. Let's loosen that screw a bit, see if we can get it to... Oh, yeah, straight away. Oh, that's so annoying. So this screw, yeah, the tolerances are off. This screw should be able to be fully tightened and the coupling still move. But when you tighten it, yeah, the coupling's stiff. So again, 
in proper design. Should be a little bit more clearance there between the the head of the screw and the sort of loop on the coupling piece. Yeah, so that's not good. At least now though, the wagons should couple. But of course now because that screw's loose, it runs the risk of coming out and losing the coupling. Not very impressed. Right, take three, third time's the charm. <laughs> it's still not centered. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah, there's a little bit of plastic which runs along two notches on top of the coupling. And when the coupling is pivoted, that piece of plastic flexes and wants to return it to the center. But yeah, there's no grunt to it. There's no sort of uh, real strength to it. So I've helped it out, fair enough. Still not coupled right. Yeah, the Locos coupling hook still missed the wagons, but uh, at least it did couple and I can manually fix it. So yeah, couplings, again, dead loss. Simple, simple to get couplings right. This one's not right. Anyway, let's see how it gets on with the load. All right, there it goes. And on the inside line, well, the middle line, I've got the DJM version of pretty much the well, I'm going to leave that stopped because I want you to listen to this one. So as far as I can tell, this one's got exactly the same mechanism inside it, possibly with an upgraded motor, but pretty much the same. Listen to how much louder this is. Maybe it is the motor. It doesn't really sound like gear noise, does it? Could be motor noise then. So I'm going to say either I got lucky and there's a better motor in my EFE one, or they, this one's cut out. You see what I mean? This is not a fluke. It does this all the time. Um, so yeah, I would say, if I had to guess, they've upgraded the motor because they're quieter and smoother. Seems to have better torque as well. This one, see that? Wheels slow down to, well, it's cut out now, but yeah, the wheels slow right down under load. The new EFE one doesn't do that. So I think, yeah, slightly better motor. Right, off you go then. Go on. Yes, very irritating to run because of all the cutting out. And then on the inside line, I have an example of what I would say you should probably buy instead of the Loco I've reviewed today. So this is the Rapido Hunslet 16 inch. It's actually a new tooled Loco, came out, was it this year? Yeah, I think it was this year, possibly the end of last year, I forget now. But anyway, it was a new tooled Loco. It's not some recycled DJM nonsense. 20 quid cheaper on RRP. More detail, more finesse, better finish, better mechanism. It's not a perfect mechanism, but better and better performance as well due to its flywheel. Look at that, beautifully smooth and quiet. So at the end of the day, there's no real reason to buy the EFE J94. I think other customers have come to the same conclusion and that could explain why presumably people haven't been buying them and they've had to reduce the price. And I'm glad. I think it was a mistake to assume that people would pay so dearly for such a relatively low quality model. Other than that though, when it's away from the points where it keeps cutting out, it runs very, very nicely on the straight or curved track. Yeah, nice and smooth, pulling power not fantastic, but it is able to haul a decent sized freight train. So it's not too much of a problem in practice. And yes, the torque does seem to be a lot better than on the J94 from DJM. So while I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, if you do want a J94, yeah, I would probably go for the EFE one over the DJM one, just because if mine's anything to go by, the performance is slightly better. Also, I've got some other saddle tanks in the sidings. So comment down below, let me know how many you can spot and I will pin the first correct answer. Let's have some ratings then for the J94 from EFE Rail. Yeah, it's not a great looking score. As always, there's good and bad, just like there is in every model. Probably a bit more bad than there is good here, but let's go a bit deeper. Level of detail, I've given three star. There are some good aspects to the level of detail. I think the general molded detail does look okay. And I like the details such as the separately fitted lamp brackets. Those look good, but you've got that plasticky finish, which isn't great. You've got plastic details, such as whistles and buffers, which just don't cut it, in my opinion. Quite basic cab detail with no separately fitted regulator or anything like that, just molded detail, although it is painted, so that's pretty good. And you've got the complete lack of screw link couplings too, which is a pity. Performance is really, really good, and it would be five star if not for the fact that it does cut out on the points quite consistently, and also the fact that the couplings are not that well designed. I'm not a fan of having to loosen screws to get components to work properly. 
those screws are not supposed to be squeezing those couplings. They're only there to stop the couplings coming out of position. The pulling power due to the light weight of the Loco is not impressive either. 0.22 newtons, that's around 16 coaches. The smaller Rapido Hunslet, that's the 16 incher, that's actually quite a bit more powerful. No real excuse for that, it's just very light and plasticky and it shows in the pulling power. The mechanism on the same strain is two star for me. Not keen on the pickup solution. Very, very difficult to maintain this. You can't really clean the pickups per se without fully disassembling the loco. And speaking of disassembly, not great at all. The body was very reluctant to come off. The so-called cleaverly hidden DCC decoder socket was actually not that cleaverly hidden because I really had to struggle to get that smoke box door off. It looked like it had been accidentally glued on or perhaps the model was painted while that was fitted. Still not fantastic. The internals, not very good, very plasticky. Tiny cordless motor without a flywheel, although I have to say the performance of that cordless motor is pretty good, so that's not much of a criticism. But overall, yeah, there's not much to shout about with the mechanism here. I think we've seen quite a lot better for quite a lot less money. Quality then, I've given it three star. I mean, it's good in that the build quality is pretty high. There's a minimum of visible glue, that sort of thing. But again, you've got that cheap plastic construction. Why is the body so plasticky? No die cast running plate, no heavy die cast chassis on the inside. The tanks are completely empty. You've literally just got the frames that hold the wheels that are die cast, and that's not enough for a logo of this size. As an expensive model, it should have been heavier, and a bit more metal construction would have gone a long way for this. Value for money then, the RRP is £149.95, which is one star, that's a joke, and treating customers like they are idiots. The latest price of £79.50 is a lot better, I would say that's more or less what this loco is worth at the retailers there. I didn't quite pay that, I paid £89.96, which is obviously a bit better, but it's still a very cheap and nasty model for the best part of £100. So on balance I've given it 2.5 star, unless you can pick one of these up at a real discount, this is not something that I would recommend, because you can do a lot better. The Rapido Hunslet 16 inch, not quite the same loco, but similar enough, you'd be far better to pick one of those up, those are £20 cheaper on RRP. And even Hornby's J94 has about the same level of detail. Still not great in terms of its mechanism, but at least it's more affordable. Overall, that's 5.56 out of 10, or a grade of E. Yeah, wasn't much good when DJM produced it, and now several years later, when with a much higher price, that hasn't done much to improve the model in my eyes. Into the logbook we go then, 19th place, quite near the bottom, above the Bradford Exchange Royal Remembrance set. I hope they enjoy being next to each other on the logbook. And it's below the Hornby A2-3. Yeah, too old, too dated, too expensive, and not high enough quality to justify the price. Well, there you have it then, folks. That is my review of the EFE Rail, or XDJM, for it is pretty much the same thing, J94. Yeah, I was disappointed by this, but I was not surprised. Yeah, it's pretty much exactly as I remember the DJM one being, except for a slight improvement to the performance, which is actually quite good. Yeah, motor seems to be a lot better in this one, uh, but that's pretty much the only thing I'm going to praise this for, given how much more expensive this is than the DJM version and how it really hasn't been improved. I suppose the next 18 pin decoder socket is compatible with more decoders now, but that doesn't really make this a 150 pound model in my opinion. So yeah, relatively disappointing, but I hope you found it entertaining nevertheless, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you've got any thoughts on these locos, please do comment down below and let me know what those are. Do you think I was fair? Do you think I was too harsh? Please also let me know. Obviously, this is only my opinion. If you disagree, that is fine, and I'd love to hear about it. For now, though, once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you very, very soon. All right, cheers, folks. You take care.